Hi everyone, I'm Chrissy B and today on the show, which is the UK's only TV program dedicated to your mental health and well-being, we're going to be telling you, our lovely viewers, what you can do if you're ever facing a feeling of shock. Giving us a psychological look at how shock affects our mental health is Dr. Audrey Tang. We'll also be showing you the story of former Royal Marine sniper Jamie Sanderson, who served in Afghanistan. He was under attack in intense, chaotic battlegrounds and the contrast of returning home to peaceful England came as a shock which took a toll on his mental health. But he'll be telling us about an interesting event that caused him to fight back. Resident family coach Sharon Lawton gives us some helpful advice on how to deal with shock when it comes to children. And also on the show today, we have Helen Ashard with positive news in this week's A Helping of Happy. Nutritionist Hannah Richards gives us a yummy recipe that helps calm down your nerves. And resident Dr. Rob Hicks answers your medical questions. And finally, I'll be telling you about two personal experiences I went through that were shocking and how I dealt with them. Now, according to Psychology Today, psychological shock is when you experience a surge of strong emotions and the corresponding physical reaction in response to a stressful event. Shock can take a long time to leave your system and can have lasting health effects, which include feeling disconnected with reality, the shakes, an adrenaline rush and more. But what about our mental health? Here's what you're saying on Twitter about the subject. Peter sends his regards. My best wishes to everyone dealing with the mental trauma and psychic shock you're assaulted with daily. Duke says, shock is something your body does automatically to protect you from mental trauma. You can't control it. So do you have anything to tell us about shock? Have you been through a personal experience that you'd like to share with us? Do get in touch on info at chrissybshow.tv, on Twitter or Instagram at chrissybshow, or post on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. But now it's time to get the professional opinion of our resident expert, Dr. Audrey Tang. Welcome to the show, Audrey. Thanks for having me, Chrissy. So we're going to be speaking all about shock and yes. how to deal with it. But first, let's take a look at this video. Now, this is the story of former Royal Marine sniper Jamie Sanderson, who served in Afghanistan. And he was under attack in intense battlegrounds. And actually, the contrast of returning home to peaceful England came as a shock which actually affected his mental health. But he'll be telling us about an interesting event that caused him to fight back. Afghanistan in 2005, six, seven, was kind of the, the, the most recent of, of the heavy fighting conflicts out there. Uh, and that was the beginning of a, a kind of new chapter. Um, I'd been to Afghanistan prior to that uh, in 2000 and, um, six we deployed into a really intense area where any um, any allied forces that had arrived had kind of come into neighborhoods out of the air and just set up base and tried to hold the ground and at the time the Taliban were, were running these villages and these locations and they didn't like that as you can imagine having foreign forces arrive on their doorstep so each of these outposts became quite a, an intense battleground and in some cases the, the locations were under siege um, pretty much day and night. Um, we, we went into one of those in a really uh, busy place uh, in a place called Sangin um, and the, the, op the forward operating base that we were in was kind of under attack most days um, into the nights and varying different types of attack as well and, you, and you're living in a really intense um, nerve-wracking kind of environment you were waiting to get hit hit on um, and if you went out on a patrol you were waiting you know for something to go bang under your feet or or for the base that you'd left behind to get hit um, quite quite a tough environment to not just exist and live in because of the heat and, and the dryness of the summer, but actually a frightening place to live as well as a human being. The last deployment I did to Afghanistan was enough for me to have reached my brink, I think, when it comes to stress levels. I describe it now as my, my glass was full and the um, coping with stress was be beginning to be difficult for me, which had started out there, I believe. I'd started to feel differently when I was out there. Um, 
in an environment where you are expecting to get hit, hurt, potentially kill on a daily basis. And I just found, I found the shock of returning home, if you like, from such a chaotic soldiering environment um, to all of a sudden the peace and tranquility of the UK um, and day-to-day -day mundane life. A really shock, a real shock to the system. The daily function of the brain kind of subsides and the, the heightened power that it creates whilst in a place like Afghanistan then thrives, it, it then takes over. And so I was uh, starting to have nightmares and, and sleepless nights. Um, I was very sensitive. I remember on a number of occasions hit, hitting the floor when there was a loud bang or something nearby. Um, which, you know, in Afghanistan is going to keep you alive, then sort of reactions. But in Tesco's, it doesn't make any sense. And when it got to a point for me when um, my memory was suffering, I, I, I was really confused. Um, I had to put my hands up and say, you know, I need some help here. And I was taken to the doctors and we followed all the advice and, and, and began some treatment as soon as was possible, which, which was another th three or four months later. And at the same time, I, I went and climbed um, Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. And I learned probably one of the most important lessons of my life on the top of Mount uh, Kilimanjaro. Um, you arrive at the top um, at almost 20,000 feet of altitude at, at dawn. You climb the last pitch through the night. Um, and I, I remember getting to the top and the guide that took us up said, do you realize the one thing that got you here this morning, which was my mental strength, is actually the one thing you were told was broken, my mental strength. And I realized that it wasn't broken. It was thriving and living in a different place. And um, it, it was injured, if you like. It was limping. And I was just mystified by this concept that my brain's actually stronger than it ever was, having been through what it had been through. Uh, and there was a day when I guess I describe it as I, I, take it on, I took on the devil, I, I describe it, when I, the, the blackness all around me that had become all consuming and, and I didn't think there was a way through it. And it was a physical fight that I put up to, to smash that and break it and, and win back. Uh, and as soon as I started to do that, it, it shrunk away. You know, when I, 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 I could have gone down and down and down and down and kept going and, and following the advice of this black evil, if you like. But I didn't. I chose to, to punch it back and, and fight my way out of it. And, and that was a turning point for me when it got as bad as it could have ever got, I believe. Um, putting up a fight actually made it disappear. It made this blackness shrink away and life took, took over and became more important than death. Very interesting story there, Audrey. What do you yes. think? Yes, um, also quite difficult to watch right at the beginning as well before mm. it turned. Um, I think there's three key things that he mentions which are very, very important. The first is that feeling of waiting to die. That's a horrible yeah. Yeah. thought um, to have with you. The responsibility that he had for his troop, yeah. for everybody yeah. that he yeah. was working with. Um, and he also adds about bringing emotional baggage. Now that's something which we don't usually think about, that shock can actually affect us more if we've got a lot to deal with already. Yeah, yeah. As he says, his, his glass was already a little bit fuller than other people's. And so if you're already dealing with a lot, it comes as a bigger shock later on because mm -hmm. you just can't manage any more. What I loved about it though, was of course the, the powerful story at the yeah, end yeah. and how he knew he wasn't broken. Mm -hmm. It was just that his mental health had been affected in some way, but what actually got him through his achievement was actually what was he was building up all the time he was over in Afghanistan. Was amazing, wasn't it? Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. It's a very inspirational. Brilliant. Okay, so tell us more about shock. You know, why does it obviously we know why it happens, but how yes. does it affect someone? Um, well, psychological shock is a little bit different to medical shock. In that medical shock, it's very life threatening, and the symptoms arrive very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Psychological shock can be a bit of a slow burn, and you may not realise you're suffering from it until perhaps somebody else says to you. I think you're behaving a little bit strangely. Mm. Um, it can happen because you've, your body has been functioning at such a high level of adrenaline and then suddenly for it to stop, 
your body doesn't really know what to do with itself anymore after yeah. that. And that can be a real problem. And it can lead to things like wanting to isolate yourself or maybe even wanting the, the other extreme, saying yes to everything because you don't want to be on your own. Oh. Um, it can, of course, if you don't get it treated, it can lead to anxiety and depression, it can be post-traumatic stress disorder, nightmares. Um, and those things can make normal functioning very difficult because if added to that, you're not sleeping, you're not eating, then you begin to lose the ability to just function mm -hmm. as you would on an everyday basis. Um, there are a number of things that you can do, and of course, talking to somebody really helps, but the first is actually mm. be able to recognise when you're feeling anxious, when you're feeling upset, if you're crying a lot more than usual. Mm. And if somebody does point it out to you, don't just dismiss them straight away, think about it. Because it must have taken a lot for them to e say something in the exactly, first place. Exactly, yeah. exactly, because we don't like to interfere usually. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's one thing. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to, to get help for shock as well. Um, going to see a professional is always mm -hmm. good. Getting involved in the community can be very important. Certainly for somebody who's served in forces, you may have a lot of extra skills that you might be able to pass on to yeah, a local community true. group, scout yeah. groups, girl guides, any of those sorts of um, companies which, who would love to have that sort of experience. Even donating blood if that's possible sometimes, that can really mm -hmm. help. The most important things though are don't self-medicate because that leads to all kinds of other problems yeah, yeah. Um, with alcohol or drugs or anything like that. Try not to isolate yourself. If you realise that you're doing that, maybe do something about that. But similarly, don't overextend yourself because you do need time yeah. to process what's going on. Um, shock is one of those things where it, it can come up again, those feelings can be triggered and you may not realise it's going to happen. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a long process of healing. but. It, it, gradually, if you keep at it, it will it will yeah. get better. Okay. And sometimes you need that that moment to actually turn around and say, right, I am going to take control of this. Yeah, and that's always Brilliant. that's hard okay. to do, but. And just, and it's just funny, anything that friends and family can do to help. Yes, um, be there, listen, mm -hmm. signpost. Um, one of the things that I would say were useful for friends and family, and also very very useful for you ask directly for the help that you need. Mm -hmm. So if you need someone to look after your children, if you need someone to make you dinner, if you need someone just to be there and listen to you, please, please ask. Because so often, and it's so, so sad, I hear a lot of people who have depression and they will say, oh, I, my friends also, they're gonna be there for me and they're not because um, I'm depressed now and no one's coming around. They don't yeah, know they and don't they know don't yeah, like to true. interfere. They want to respect you, so please ask directly. Most people will be there in a heartbeat. So. Yeah. Definitely. Talk, talk, and be, yeah. be clear. Audrey, thank you so much. Pleasure. And we shall see you again next week. Yes. Thank you. Well, everyone, do you have anything to tell us about shock? And have you been through a personal experience that you'd like to share with us? Do get in touch on info at chrissybshow.tv, on Twitter or Instagram at chrissybshow, or post on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Don't go away because after the break, we talk to Sharon Norton on the best ways parents can deal with their children's stress and shock. And also, Helena Shard gives us the latest in feel-good news, but first, which of these is a symptom of shock? Is it A, pale, cold, clammy skin, B, shallow, rapid breathing, or C, nausea? Find out the answer after this break. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show, everyone, the program that loves to look after your mental health and well-being. So before the break, we asked you which of these is a symptom of shock? Is it A, pale, cold, clammy skin, B, shallow, rapid breathing, or C, nausea? The answer is actually all of them. Along with vomiting, dizziness, and lightheadedness, shock can cause an array of profound physical responses, most of which is linked to the sudden spike in adrenaline when faced with an unexpected situation. Well, now here to discuss with us about how to deal with shock in children is our resident guest, Sharon Norton. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Hello, Chris. Lovely to have you back on. It's always a pleasure to come. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, Sharon, do children and adults deal with shock differently, would you say? Interesting. I think um, what's really uh, important to recognise is that all of us, children and adults, experience stress at some time in their lives. Mm -hmm. The difference being is that where children are concerned, they need that little bit of extra help. Well, actually, they just need help in yeah. being able to manage those big feelings like shock. Mm -hmm. 
and stress. And of course, when uh, we are experiencing stress, um, and I'm just going to show you some little yes. things that I use when I'm talking about stress and shock with families. Uh -huh. The part of the brain that's activated is the reptile brain. Um, and that, that really is our survival brain. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the job of the survival brain is, is to activate that fight, flight and freeze response. It's there to keep us safe. Okay. So a child who has been um, exposed to prolonged shock or um, exposed to stress, what happens is their little reptile brain um, has been sort of put on, on fight, flight or freeze. Okay. Now, a child who has been, well, put it this way, if our reptile brain has been scared a lot by maybe a severe shock or mm -hmm. stress of some kind, it doesn't forget. And okay. so children who have been exposed to extreme shock or, or, um, or stress, um, their little reptile brain, their survival brain, is sort of working overtime. And what we can find sometimes is they can be triggered into that fight, flight or freeze response by the slightest tiny thing. It might oh. be a sound or a smell or something that okay. just sort of yeah. shocks that um, into, into play. Now, this part of the brain is not very clever. It's there to do a job. It's okay. just there to keep us alive, you know? Um, and so then we start to see maybe behaviors like um, uh, anger or anxiety mm. or extreme worry or withdrawal children who can't explain and verbalize how they feel what happens is often it shows in their body language okay Sharon are there ways that parents shouldn't deal with their child's stress or shock that mm. maybe was, was quite harmful what's really interesting is that um, a lot of adults find it very difficult to deal with stress Mm. And that's generally because they haven't been taught good ways to manage stress as children. As I said before, okay. we need help as young people to be able to manage that really big feeling of shock or, or mm. feeling of overwhelming stress. So that's when we often see that adults uh, have an inability to be able to cope. So everything that we do as parents, every time we respond in a particular way, okay. particularly if it's an unhelpful way, maybe dismissing a child's feelings or telling them you know, that they've got nothing to worry about, or maybe even modeling unhealthy and unhelpful ways ourselves, will be laying down synapses in the brain that actually don't allow them to be able to deal with those feelings helpfully. So okay. I think the, the ways not to deal with it is by dismissing it, showing unhelpful ways, um, not allowing them to, to talk about their feelings. They would be really unhelpful ways to develop those healthy synapses in the brain. Okay, and what about tips then? What should parents do? Well, that brings me on to another little friend of mine. Okay. I like the little friends. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our owl. Okay. Now the owl, the wise owl, represents our neocortex, so our thinking brain, our okay. learning brain. And that's where all our strategies are kept, all of our problem solving and planning and language skills and all of that mm. type of thing. Now, if we have um, been modelled as children really good ways to be able to deal with stress and shock, mm -hmm. then we can access those neuropathways in the brain to be able to calm down and okay. you know, keep calm and in control our little um, our little reptile brain so there are lots of different ways that we can do that so everything that we do because the brain in the early years is really highly sensitive to stress and mm. the delicate architecture of the brain can be damaged if we don't support children during stress and shock so everything that we do, the way that we respond, the way that we listen, the way that we play, the way that we cuddle, the way that we respond to challenging behavior, mm. the way that we support them with big feelings will help to develop a nice healthy owl brain okay. so that we can develop that. So some different strategies that we can use. The first one I would say is, is just teaching good breathing techniques. So I thought perhaps we might have a little go, is yes, that okay? Ahead, yeah. So if I show you one sitting down, a couple okay. sitting down, and uh -huh. then perhaps we can stand up and I'll show you some more active ones. Okay. Is that all right? All right. Okay. okay. Is that all right? <laughs> We're going to stand up at some point. Is that all right? Okay. We're going to have to adjust the cameras though. Yeah. We'll Unless do that we do last. it on wide. Do that last maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll okay. That. So I've brought along what uh, I'll call a visual breathing buddy. And things, you know, there's lots of different ones that you can use, but this one's lovely. It's light, lovely and colourful. And all we do is we breathe in through our nose and out through our mouths mm -hmm. um, in time to the expansion and the, and oh, the sort of... Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so we breathe in. And then we breathe out. And then breathe in. And out. And once more, in. 
and then out. And it Very gives nice. children sort of a yeah, visual yeah, yeah. distraction as well, okay. which is, is really nice. I love that. Nice sort of breathing yeah. visual as well. The other one is a sort of like a figure of eight breathing, and it includes that sort of gentle nurturing touch, which mm -hmm. releases oxytocin, which is a, a killer of cortisol, which is obviously part of that stress response that's fired. Yeah. So we can just, you know, uh, let me do it on you. Is that okay? okay? Yeah. So if I'm your if I'm your mum or your caring yeah. adult, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a figure of eight really gently on your forearm. Okay. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to breathe in through one part of the figure of eight and okay. out through the other part and just follow the rhythm that I'm going to be using. Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's breathe in. And out. And in. And out. And in. And out. Okay. So all lovely yeah, and gentle yeah, and tickly. Yeah. Um, and when of course the, that gentle nurturing touch does release all of those lovely feel-good hormones and helps to you know, bring down the, um, the blood pressure and the heart rate and everything okay. else. Now would you do those activate. things like when there's a situation and when the child is feeling stressed or is it stuff that you can do like on a regular basis? I think, I think it's a... good to be practicing the stuff when we don't need them because yeah. then our, our brain remembers, mm -hmm. yeah, because when we're in fight, flight or freeze our reptile brain takes over and we don't always think about doing that stuff. Yeah. But to do it in the moment is great too. Right, so thanks very much Sharon for talking to us about shock and stress and how to You're deal with welcome. it in children. Very and welcome. See you again very soon. Look forward to it, Chris. Thank you. Well, everyone, now to give us some latest in feel-good news is our own Helena Shard in this week's A Helping of Happy. Welcome to the show, Helena. Thank you, Chrissy. All about shock today. Oh, I'm it's quite intrigued at what news you would have brought for us today. Lots of lots of different different. There's so many different things about shock, isn't there? Okay. Different variety of shocks. So, um, starting, I just want to say congratulations to Prince Harry and Meghan for okay. their magical wedding because it was yeah. really really special. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to so the Queen, also threw a birthday party for Prince Charles, who's 70, mm -hmm. um, which was great fun with all his charities there and everything earlier than his real birthday. But oh. Prince Harry gave a really lovely warm speech about his dad highlighting his dad's selfless ways which was really quite special mm -hmm. um, also leading into shock relationships uh, Prince Charles and Princess Diana as we know wasn't a match made yeah. in heaven um, <laughs> a, a book a fairly new book by Sally Bedell Smith uh, it's like an autobiography on Prince Charles mm -hmm. the passions and paradoxes of an improbable life um, he was absolutely shocked by Princess Diana's erratic behaviour, I mean, it really hit him. He didn't have the coping skills to be able to, to, mm -hmm. to work with her. Um, he persuaded her to see a therapist. She didn't see um, him for that long, but he actually saw the therapist for the following 14 years, and it was oh, really, really, really helpful for him. Okay. Yeah, so I just thought that was just quite an interesting yeah, tip. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Ooh. So Charles is obviously celebrating his 70th, 70th year, but we're also celebrating the NHS his mm -hmm. 70th year, which I think is really special. And Prince William paid tribute to the NHS at the Heroes, um, a special event marking obviously the 70th anniversary. And he, it was a very sweet message. Um, perhaps the most wonderful thing about the NHS is its people, the skill and care and dedication they provide every day is truly inspirational. Mm. Uh, which is really special. Yeah, a lot of people complain about it, don't they? But yeah, there's so many but, good you things. Know, so many good things. Um, and a great article I was reading about emergency services staff, and they're obviously special, but they're not super beings. Yeah. So really, yeah. that we have to look after people whose job it is to help us. Mm -hmm. And a great article on Dan Farnworth, um, and in fact also Richard Mortem. Um, so Dan had been working for the ambulance service for just over a decade. And he saw he was on a call out, which basically changed everything for him. Um, he felt mm. completely shell shocked. Uh, his mental state deteriorating progressively, just in a big dark hole, nightmares, withdrawn, not being very nice with his family at home. You know all yeah, things yeah. that you can imagine. He was just didn't know what to do. Um, he thought long and hard and thought, I have to talk to somebody. And he thought, right, okay, I'm going to speak to a paramedic friend called Richard Morton. So he confessed he was struggling on the text. It was very hard for him to write this text. Mm -hmm. He kept on deleting it. And then when he sent it, he actually switched his phone off because he didn't know what he'd get back. Really? Because he was that oh, nervous. Wow. Um, but when he looked at it, it was really lovely. It was telling him to get the kettle on and that he was going to come around for a oh, chat. So it was really, nice. they talked it through. Um, obviously, it ended up being PTSD, I think. Mm -hmm. as, 
and together they decided to get together and establish a network called Our Blue Light, um, which is absolutely amazing. And its aim is to improve the mental health and well-being of working life in the emergency services. Yes. Traumatising, so, isn't it? Sometimes? Absolutely, you can imagine. It was horrible. Yeah. I, you know, it was some of the things I was reading weren't, weren't so great. But anyway, so they're absolutely thrilled. They also won an NHS Heroes Award, a oh, mental health nice. one. So yeah. they're really, it's really great. Fantastic. Um, also moving on to an emotional memorial service for the first an anniversary of the Manchester um, mm. Arena attack. Uh, which which actually went incredibly well. So at something like 10.30 at night, uh, choirs led a mass of a sing-along. Mm -hmm. So everyone was singing, everyone, it was obviously people that had been affected, everyone just got together and they were singing Don't Look Back in Anger at the yeah. time, which is really, so it just shows love wins. Of you course, know? Yeah. Absolutely, so, and talking about now a few people involved in the incident um, mm. Freya Lewis and her friend Nell Jones they were so excited attended the Manchester event um, Freya lost her friend Nell in the accident but she also had sp spent a long emotional time recovering uh, broken bones throughout her body yeah, shrapnel okay, throughout yeah. her body oh, they didn't think. think that she'd survive you know that kind of thing quite a miracle didn't think wow. she'd walk <clears throat> and also there was a special nurse called Jenny Grant who helped not only her body heal but spoke to her every night because she was so shocked about losing her friends mm -hmm. she couldn't sleep and the nurse spoke to her every single night for all the time that she was there which is lovely isn't mm -hmm. it so the good news is she's now walking brilliant oh, and amazing. she wanted to be able to give back to the nhs yeah. um, and she's done that by now she's raised so far just over forty thousand pounds wow which is brilliant and uh, she Excellent. also won nhs fundraising heroes award which was yeah, really yeah, quite yeah. sweet. It was, was lovely. Helena, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chrissy. We'll see you again next week. Absolutely. And actually, if you guys out there have any good news that you've heard anywhere in the world that you'd like to share with us, do get in touch on info at chrissybshow.tv. Well, after the break, we are going to our medical expert, Dr. Rob Hicks, to answer your medical questions, including this one. I need a pair of glasses that will not only block the sun's glare, but also the UV rays. My eyes are extremely sensitive. What are my options? Find out the answer after this break. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone, the show that loves to look after your mental health and well being. So now it's time to head over to Dr. Rob Hicks to answer all of your medical questions. And if you have a question for him, all you need to do is email us on doctor at chrissybshow.tv. Welcome to the show, Rob. Hi, Chris. Hi. Are you ready to answer some I am questions? Indeed. Let's, let's, okay, let's, move on. let's go for it. So, the first person saying, I need a pair of glasses that will not only block the sun's glare, but also the UV rays. My eyes are extremely sensitive. Do I have options? Simple answer, yes. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, lots of options for somebody in, in that situation. So, you know, in, in your position, the best place to go and get the advice from is your optometrist, you know, the, opt mm -hmm. the optician. Um, well, they'll advise you on the, the complete range of options for you. So, for example, um, if you normally wear glasses, nowadays it's very easy and straightforward to get sunglasses, but with prescription lenses in them. So that will protect your eyes from the glare and it will also uh, protect your eyes from the UV rays. The other thing is there are transition lenses, and these are the lenses that you may be familiar with, that um, are clear in, in sort of usual light, but when the sun comes out, they, they, they darken. So they contain a, a substance that actually, in response to sunlight, darken to protect your eyes. So you can speak to your optician, your optometrist about that as well. And you're very wise to raise this as, as an issue because many people, you know, they know to protect their skin from UV rays from the sun, uh, but they're not aware really that they have to protect their eyes as well because it is possible to get cancer, you know, essentially malignant melanoma, that, that the dangerous form of cancer in the backs of the eyes as well as on the skin. So yes, that's why we advise people not just to use sunscreen in, in sunny weather, but also to wear a, a wide brimmed hat or a peaked cap and sunglasses, you know, to protect the eyes. Yeah, so important. Next question, Rob. Is it normal for a woman to get pimples on her breasts? I'm a young woman and I sometimes get whiteheads around my nipples. What is the best way to treat this? Is it the same as facial acne? That's a really good question, mm -hmm. isn't it? And I, I suspect that's a question that's been worrying yeah. uh, this viewer. 
The, the simple answer to this is, is the best thing to do is get your doctor to check them first off um, to get a precise diagnosis and then you'll be able to be advised on whether treatment is actually necessary. What it sounds like to me is something called Montgomery glands. Now these are the glands that are normal. They appear on the part of the nipple called the areola. So that's the area around the nipple itself not on the breast, but on the, on the, the, the dark, it has the same color as the nipple, but it's the circular area around it. Now these Montgomery glands, they produce a liquid, a white liquid, which can appear like whiteheads, you know, just like acne can, you know, on the face and other parts of the body. Um, but it's normal, um, it's not harmful in any way, and what you'll probably find with these, with these, these Montgomery glands is that, is that the whiteness comes and goes, and actually doesn't need any treatment, and what's important is not do not try and pick them because A, they don't need to be treated uh, and B, if you do pick them, you might cause um, scarring or, or put some infection in. Now, it is possible also to get acne there as well, but generally with acne, like facial acne, these spots will be red, inflamed and tender, if not painful. Um, so if they're white, then it's most likely to be Montgomery glands. But as I said, get them checked by the doctor just to be on the sure side. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Next question, Rob. I don't understand the whole sugar birth control pill thing. Is it bad to skip the sugar pill? I'm 24 and I've been on the pill for two years now, but I often skip the sugar pill because it just seems silly. Is there a real reason to take them? That's a really good question. I have no yeah. idea what this person's talking no, about. This, well, <laughs> with, with a contraceptive yeah. pill, mm -hmm. many of the preparations, you have three weeks of act, what we call active pills. So mm -hmm. those pills have the hormones in them. Yeah. And then the fourth week, is essentially doesn't have the hormones in it. And people call it, you know, a placebo pill oh, okay. or a sugar yeah. pill. Yeah. yeah. Now the reason behind this is is simply for convenience and to help a woman not forget to take the pills. So you have your your 21 days of the the pills with the hormones in, and then you have a week free really of hormones, which is the sugar pills. And it's during that mm. week that you'll get your period or what is actually technically called a withdrawal bleed. Um, when somebody's on, on oral contraception. Um, so it's, it's to try and help a woman from missing out on the active pills, you know, the, the, 20, you know, the ones that actually have the hormones in. It is perfectly safe not to take those sugar pills in that week, provided you always remember mm. to start taking the next pack of pills on the right day. So that's, that's why you have those, um, those seven days. Um, and indeed, why if you don't want to, you don't have to take them. But many, most women do just because it's simply convenient and it helps them remember to take a pill every day. Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. But it's okay. a really good question. Yeah. And last question for today, Rob. My mother got a horrible headache and then began to have other strange, strange symptoms. She's now in hospital and they suspect it's an aneurysm. What causes aneurysms and how can it be fixed? All oh, right. This is a very, very serious situation. It's very, mm -hmm. you know, it's a medical emergency, this. Um, I, I'm sorry to hear this has happened to your mum. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that she's in hospital um, because what, essentially what it sounds like she's had is, is, is a brain hemorrhage where the aneurysm is, you get, if there's a weakness in one of the blood vessels, one of the arteries, um, it, can for, it can stretch. And that's like a balloon, essentially. So the blood pressure, the blood going through the artery causes pressure on that weakened area and it pushes it out like a, like a balloon. Um, and that's, you know, that area is weakened to start with. Um, generally speaking, um, if, if there's an aneurysm present and it doesn't cause symptoms, you know, it, 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 or rather it doesn't cause symptoms, you don't know it's there. But when, when, you get, when it ruptures, when it bursts, you get these symptoms. You get what's called a thunderclap headache. It's the worst headache people have ever experienced. It's like being hit on the head very, very viciously. They sometimes get symptoms like nausea and vomiting as well. Now, what causes them? Nobody knows precisely what causes them, but there's a greater risk of having them if you've got um, high blood pressure, if you're a smoker, if there's a family history of aneurysms. Um, and so, of course, the ways to try and prevent them is to live a healthy lifestyle by not smoking and keeping your blood pressure under control. They are more common in women and they're more common over the age of 40. Um, how they're treated is usually with some form of brain surgery. So that's using a clip to essentially seal off the, the, the aneurysm, the ballooning part from the rest of the artery, or indeed putting little metal coils into that area, which again sort of protects the area from becoming weaker and rupturing. But I, but I wish your mum a very speedy recovery. Thank you, Rob. That's all for today.
My pleasure. And don't forget, everybody, please do send your questions through and Rob will be very happy to answer them. Questions about absolutely anything, right, Rob? Absolutely. Don't be embarrassed or anything. No, there's no need to be embarrassed no, at all. not at all. Don't go away because after the break, we're going to be talking to nutritionist Hannah Richards on the best foods to calm your nerves. And I'll also be telling about two personal experiences that I went through that were shocking and how I dealt with them. And also actually Hannah will be answering one of your questions. And the, one of them is, are artificial sweeteners better than sugar? Surely nothing can be worse than sugar. So see what Hannah has to say after this break. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show, everyone, where today we've been talking all about shock. And now we have Hannah Richards to demonstrate a recipe that is calming to our nerves. Hello and welcome. My name's Hannah. Today I'm going to be making something really yummy for a perfect time when you've had a bit of a shock or you're slightly anxious, or something's gone a little bit wrong, and you need something yummy to make you feel, to make yourself feel a little bit better. So there's one ingredient that I know that does that really well, and that's chocolate. And that's because chocolate has loads of magnesium in it. And often when we have had a shock, or we've had something bad happen, our body depletes itself of magnesium. And luckily for us, magnesium is found in chocolate well cacao. So here I've got some creme fraiche and all I'm doing is going to mix in some raw cacao into it. Now raw cacao by itself isn't really very sweet but we're gonna we're going to do something about that. So just take your creme fraiche, you could use cream if you're feeling really naughty but creme fraiche is just slightly healthier and you, we're just going to fold it in almost just like you fold eggs when you're making a meringue and you can see that that cacao really mixes in and gives it a nice consistency, nice texture and a nice colour. Now I'm going to keep adding because we want it to get really dark brown and just sprinkle it on top like that. So sometimes when you're sort of feeling a bit bluesy, you're feeling a little bit down, often we always reach for some chocolate, um, a hot chocolate, a chocolate bar, something sweet, because sweet foods make us feel better almost instantly. Um, but often what happens when we eat sweet foods that are too high in sugar, then we cut that sugar high comes with a crash and we get feel low again. So by having raw cacao with some natural coconut sugar and some lavender, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, you suddenly get the benefits of the good nutrients in the food as opposed to the effects of the sugar from the refined sugars that often we find in chocolate bars. So there we go, that's all st starting to look really nice there. Nice consistency and I can smell that chocolate. Now two sweeteners that you can use, one is um, coconut sugar and coconut sugar is just extracted from the, um, the coconut flour, the buds of the coconut flour and I'm going to use um, some coconut sugar so I'm going to sprinkle in a dessert spoon into there. You could use honey as well but I think for this recipe um, coconut sugar just has a more gentle taste. So just mix that in and obviously you're just going to have to try and taste it all the way through and make sure that it is nice and sweet but not too sweet. Then we're going to add some, uh, some lavender. Now lavender has got a really good medicinal effect for reducing anxiety and reducing depression and making you feel calmer. So often we put the lavender uh, flowers in tea and I'm gonna infuse it into the chocolate so that the chocolate and the lavender infuse together and give you a really nice calming effect as a dessert. So all I've done is I've put some uh, lavender flowers into some water and all I'm going to do is pour that water that's now got that flavour of the lavender. Don't worry if the lavender, if the buds go into the creme fraiche, it'll just all add to the flavour. 
And then I'm gonna mix that round again and make sure the consistency works. So you can also buy lavender in an oil and you could uh, make tea out of that or you could buy lavender flowers. Often we find lavender in potpourri or in bedrooms because again, it really helps to induce sleep and makes you nice and relaxed. And that's what the state you want to be in before you go to bed. So you can see that's a really nice consistency now. So it's chocolate, lavender, a bit of coconut sugar. And all I'm going to do is I'm gonna put them in these teacups, which I know is Chrissy's favorite, so that when she comes in, she's got a lovely teacup full of lavender infused chocolate to finish her night off with. You can put them in anything really, but I always like a teacup. There we go. And that's just one pot of creme fraiche and it's made enough for two. Now what you can do is you could put these in the fridge and then they'd sort of set a little bit or you can just eat them straight away. There we go. And all I'm gonna do on top is I'm just gonna sprinkle a little bit of coconut sugar on top. It's good for you, coconut sugar. There we go. And just for a little bit of decoration, a couple of lavender flowers. And there you go. A perfect snack to make yourself feel better. So now we're going to take some questions from the viewers and do remember that you can always email your question to nutrition at chrissybshow.tv. So the first question from our viewer is, are artificial sweeteners better than sugar? Surely nothing can be worse than sugar. Well, it's a really good question because we often think that you know, artificial sugar is terrible, but also sugar is terrible because it's refined sugar. And then we've got fructose, which is sugar. So there's so many sugars swimming around, we never know which is the best. My advice would be that the, the word artificial means that it's been processed, it's been chemically made. So you definitely want to avoid them. But there is a sweetener which is stevia and often that is found in some very good natural and even organic products. So if you had to veer towards a sweetener, try and find stevia and um, stay away from all the others. So question number two. Um, I know there are different types of fiber in foods and that they can have a different effect on the body. Can you tell me which are the best and how much to eat? Sure, well, fiber comes in two different forms. It's either soluble or insoluble. And we definitely need fiber in our bodies. And fiber is often found, or really only found, in everything pretty much that is a carbohydrate. So soluble fiber are found in things like lentils and beans and some whole grains, psyllium husks, and that has an effect to help the body eliminate waste through the colon. And then you've got insoluble fiber, which is mainly really found in all your vegetables and some whole grains as well. And those vegetables have all the nutrients and vitamins in them. And again, they help keep the digestive tract nice and regular. So you need a bit of both, um, but they both got slightly different roles to play. So that's all for today. Back to you, Chrissy. Thanks very much to Hannah there. So now it's time for me to share two of my personal experiences that I had with shocking situations. So the first one was where uh, one night I was fast asleep in my bed and I heard a noise in the kitchen of, it just sounded like something falling. So I decided to get up and investigate and see you know, what had fallen down so I could just basically put it back. So I remember leaving my bedroom, I put the light on in, in the hallway and uh, my my um, kitchen was just here and my bedroom was here so I, I walked out and I was just about to turn the corner when something just said to me I just felt very uncomfortable all of a sudden and something just said to me just go back where you came from go back to your room and lock the door so I, I felt so uncomfortable that I actually listened to that and I, I went back in my room I lay down and I just I tried to ignore the noise that I'd heard 
And then I heard drawers opening, so I, that, that, by that point I knew that actually was someone in the house. Um, I, I woke my husband up and he, he came out and there were actually two men in the kitchen and they, they escaped, they ran through the front door, they, they managed to escape but we saw them running down the road. But what was shocking to me, first of all, was the fact that I had almost turned the corner and secondly was that there were two very large kitchen knives missing from our, our knife block. So basically, when, obviously when I'd come out and they heard the noise, they'd taken these two knives. And at the time, like, you know, it was, um, I, it, it, all, it didn't feel real. But then in my mind, these things started to go through my mind, like, oh, you know, what, what if they'd stabbed you? What if you, they'd killed you? What if they'd done this to you? And so many things were going through my mind. And it was, it was I won't say I was in shock, but it was something that I, I was kind of reliving and thinking of, like, oh, what if this happened? What if that happened? And obviously my husband was telling me of, like, why on earth did you get up and go to the kitchen? Because I didn't actually think there was someone there. I thought someone had just, something had just fallen. But um, what, what I learned from that situation is how I kept kind of reliving what had happened and thinking of, oh my God, what the worst case scenarios. But what I then did was actually look at the other side of things, was like, okay, thank goodness that you didn't go around the corner. Thank, thank goodness that you, you're okay and that you're safe. So I had to actually switch my mind not to think of the negative things but think of the positive and that's what I actually, how I actually dealt with that situation because I can see how a situation like that can actually get very bad and how it can play on your, your mental health and obviously I know when people have break-ins, um, they did take a laptop by the way, but I can see when, when people have break-ins how much it can affect them psychologically and you know, think all these kind of thoughts that they have in their head. The second situation, I have spoken about this on the programme before, but I'd just like to share it for the benefit of the new viewers, which is when I lost my father to cancer. And again, it's something that I, it was very unexpected when he, when he was diagnosed because no one in our family had ever had cancer. And, but the, what the difficult part, as well as obviously him having cancer, was what I had to deal with at the hospital. So it was a hospital, wasn't in this country, where you know so many things were happening in that hospital, people dying all around and, it, it was awful to actually watch and obviously you know when you're there there's other patients around you see a lot of things but then it was also my own father's death as well the way it happened which was something that was for me shocking and I found that um, for quite a while after that you know after he died and everything instead of remembering him as he was and you know the funny person he was I kept reliving his last moments and the, the other things that I'd seen in the hospital with other people and I could see it was how it was trying to affect me. So again, as with the first situation, I had to bring my thoughts back to, well, actually now he's, he's okay now, he's not suffering anymore. He's not going through that pain that he was in, in his last days, in his last moments. And I had to remember, I had to force my mind to remember how things were, how good things were, how, you know, what he was like as a person. So it's, I think when it comes to things like shock, obviously I'm not saying don't try and, you know, I'm not saying try and manage things on your own. If you are really struggling, then go to see a professional, speak to someone that can help you. But also I think it's important for us as well to do our part in, in trying to control the way our mind goes because it can go off in all sorts of directions and it can keep reliving things that there's no point in reliving. For example, what was the point of me reliving um, the last moments of my father's death? What's the point? It's finished now, it's gone. So for me to keep remembering his suffering is not going to help anything, it, you know, it's not going to make any difference. So I think sometimes it's just a case of you know, switching your mind, think of other things. Yes, the thoughts will come. Yes, you, will, you might struggle for a while, but if you keep kind of policing your mind to think of the positive things instead, it really does help. Well, those are my experiences, guys. And if you have an experience that you would like to share, please do get in touch with us on info at chrissybshow.tv. Bye-bye for now. or anxiety, mm. or extreme worry, or withdrawal. Children who can't explain and verbalize how they feel, what happens is often it shows in their body language. Okay, right, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I wasn't sure what to do. I thought you were going to go to the next one. Oh, well, well, well oh, okay. when it comes to it. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay, sorry guys. One second. Hi. My name's Rob. Dr. Rob. Send me a question.